afternoon and welcome to good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on emerging therapies for blood cancer. The Leukemia Foundation would like to acknowledge that March marks Myeloma Month. We encourage those of you living with myeloma to seek out the education events being held by Myeloma Australia. My name is Tani. I'm a clinical content producer with a background in haematology nursing. Along with my colleagues, Linda, our National Education and Support Group Lead, with a background in cancer social work, and Jenny, our Education and Support Coordinator with a background in occupational therapy, we will be running today's webinar. We are joined today by Susanna Antali, who will be presenting their exp personal experience, and Dr. Kenneth Micklewaite, who will be presenting today. The Leukaemia Foundation acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands we are coming together on. We recognise their continuing connection to land, sea and the community. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the stories, traditions, the culture and hope for their people. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we go on. A reminder that the chat is live and you can add a question or comment there. We ask all questions and comments are respectful and considerate. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. For the best experience, you may prefer to set your screen to speak of you. And most importantly, please remember the information presented today is general information. And while certain diagnoses may be referred to, this webinar is not specific to any particular blood cancer or blood disorder. Research into new treatments for blood cancer and blood disorders is dynamic and ever-changing. It is not uncommon to hear about the new and emerging therapies that offer hope of a cure or longer life. Finding reliable and relevant information can be challenging. Today, we are here to find out more about immunotherapy, in particular CAR T cell therapy. Today, we are very fortunate to have two presenters tell us a little of their own personal story to set the scene. First, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce you to Susanna. Susanna is a successful business person running her own interior and soft furnishings business for 27 years. She also has two children and a husband who have all been affected by her blood cancer diagnosis, treatment challenges and decision making. Susanna is here to tell us a little of her story that led her to CAR T cell therapy last year. Thank you, Susanna. Over to you. Hey, Susanna, you need to come off mute. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> Thank you. I was first diagnosed in October 2020 with ALL, which is a rare form of leukemia in adults. And it's also much more difficult to treat in adults as a result. It's normally children that have this. Four months of chemotherapy as an inpatient, then a bone marrow transplant followed, which unfortunately failed after 11 months. So we're all very disappointed as we were hoping for at least five years of remission. And also the treatment was exhausting and painful. The way it affected my family. My son was halfway through his exams, HSC exams, when I was first hospitalised, hospitalised, and my daughter deferred her uni studies to care for me and to help keep my business running. Meanwhile, my husband held everything together and ran his own business too. Once my transplant failed, we were faced with a dilemma. Ideally, my haematologist wanted me to have CAR T therapy as they believed this would give me the best chance of survival. Unfortunately, I did not qualify for the CAR T trial, primarily because I did not have a large enough leukemia burden and, of course, due to the fact that I had what they call the children's leukemia and the cutoff age was 25 years Another option was to travel to Boston in the US and have the treatment there as it was readily available there. However, that would mean a cost of approximately a million dollars that we would have to wear. We actually did consider this as an option because we were running out of choices. In early 2023, 
it was confirmed that I was able to have CAR T under compassionate grounds. And um, I was the first patient in New South Wales to have it for ALL. It was quite, quite interesting. And I felt so incredibly lucky. And also Medicare in Australia fully covers the costs of this treatment. Obviously I'm still here, so it's working quite well. <laughs> and I, I really don't think I would be here without it. I've had run out of options, there wasn't much else to do. This, and also, once again, the side effects from CAR-T were so much milder than from the transplant. I, I breezed through it. Of course, in this three years, my family's life as well as my own has changed dramatically. I'm now in the process of actually closing down my business, which, as you mentioned, I have had for 27 years. It's just no longer important, and I really don't have the energy for it anymore. I mean, I don't know how long we'll be in remission because I believe the success rate is about 40% for CAR-T. However, I have to try. It's better than no chance, so it's worthwhile. I mean, we I'm, I'm sure we all suffer from a form of PTSD with this. When I first was diagnosed, I didn't think I would survive it. My family didn't think I would survive. But as I say, I'm still here. CAR-T has given me another chance. That, what more can I hope for? You know, I just want to have some more time with my family and enjoy what I'm doing. I can't plan anything too far ahead because I really don't know what's around the corner. But that's okay. I'm still here. My husband said one day at a time and that's what we do. It's all good. Thank you. hope that helps a bit. Thank you, Susanna, for an insight into your treatment experience. And it certainly had a big impact on obviously yourself and also your family. So thank you for sharing. Next, we will hear from Tali. Tali enthusiastically answered the call to present today. She's recently shared her story for the Australian Cancer Survivorship Centre. After undergoing CAR-T cell therapy, she has a passion to help others. She has a renewed sense of health and appreciation for the simple things in life. Tali is a baker, a mother of two beautiful children and a wife to Leonard. She, since going into remission, she has become a proud patient advocate for blood cancer and CAR-T cell therapy. Over to you, Tali. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello everyone, my name is Tally and today I am honoured to be able to share my deeply personal journey of my battle with stage 4 large B-cell lymphoma, a journey that took an unexpected turn towards hope and healing through CAR T-cell therapy. The moment of my diagnosis is still etched in my memory as one of shock and disbelief. What began as a misdiagnosis of pneumonia turned out to be lymphoma. The weight of the news hit me seeing my parents' reaction and the immediate concern for how I would convey this to my husband, Leonard, and our children. It felt as though my entire world had turned upside down and the enormity of the situation was incomprehensible. Still to this day, I can't believe it has happened to me. It's the three words you never expect or want to hear. You have cancer. I returned home and reassured our children that everything would be okay and we will talk more in the morning. I sat at the table with Leonard and just cried until my entire body ached. How could this be happening to us? My first treatment involved six cycles of intense chemotherapy, which ran for five days, 24 hours a day. Being away from my family at this time for a week, every three weeks was the worst part. Being in and out of lockdowns intensified this situation as four out of six treatments my family couldn't visit. This regime initially showed promise. However, after the sixth treatment, my PET scan revealed growth. Another type of chemotherapy was tried with the hope of a stem cell transplant afterwards. But unfortunately, the relentless progression persisted and my stem cell transplant was officially off the table. It was constant bad news after bad news. How much more could my family endure? The look on their faces when I told them the results of the scans was indescribable. The constant disappointment and fear was overwhelming. It was at this point I actually asked my husband if he thought I was going to die. Cancer is like dropping a stone in a pond. The effects ripple out to everyone in your immediate family. They all feel the impact from worries and sadness to dealing with changes in daily life. 
Friends and extended relatives also feel the ripple, wanting to help but not always knowing how. My illness affected routines, emotions and plans for the future. But even in tough times, the love and support from everyone around me created ripples of hope and strength as we navigated through the challenges of cancer together. But that's when the possibility of CAR T cell therapy entered the picture, a concept entirely foreign to me at the time. But upon learning about CAR T from my haematologist, I soon learned it was like Pac-Man eating away at my cancer cells. A newfound sense of optimism ignited within me. I told myself, this is going to be it. It's going to work. It has to work. It was my only hope. So once again, my cells were collected, specially packaged and sent off to Los Angeles to be modified to understand how to recognize and attack my lymphoma. After three rounds of cell depleting chemo, I was ready for my new supercharged cells. The infusion didn't take very long at all and was rather uneventful. After 11 long days in hospital, I was finally allowed to return home. Fast forward to my 30-day PET scan, any traces of ominous black spots had completely disappeared. No evidence of disease were the words I heard. It was a moment of sheer disbelief and joy in the haematologist's office, where Leonard's jaw dropped at the extraordinary transformation he could see. He couldn't believe what he saw. It's a miracle, he said. Being able to go home and tell our children that it worked was the best feeling in the world. It was the moment we had all been praying for. Sorry. Reflecting on the journey, you've given the chance to choose again. CAR-T would undoubtedly triumph over traditional chemo. While not without its challenges, the ease and effic effic efficacy made all the difference. To the incredible individuals responsible for creating CAR-T, I extend my deepest thanks and gratitude. CAR-T is not just a medical intervention, it is the reason I'm alive today. If medicine could manufacture miracles, <clears throat> they did so with CAR-T. CAR-T was my gift and my only hope of remission. At my lowest point during treatment, simple activities like walking a few steps felt like a monumental task. We've just had our first family holiday, something people don't realise how special it is until it's gone, and something I thought I would never get to experience again. <clears throat> if you had asked me if this was possible in the depth of chemo and diagnosis, I wouldn't have believed you. When it rained, I looked for rainbows. When it was dark, I looked for stars. <clears throat> it may be hard to find your silver lining during cancer, but it's there. If you look for it, you will find it. I feel like the luckiest, unluckiest girl. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for sharing, Tali. Um, thank you for sharing such a it's such an emotional journey and such a long emotional treatment journey. So thank you so much. Um, it gives everybody real insight into what you've been through. Um, and thank you also for your um, passion to advocate for others in this space as well. Um, I'm sure a lot of people here online at the moment really appreciate that too. Our final speaker today is Dr. Kenneth Micklewaith. Associate Professor Micklewaith is a physician scientist working in the fields of bone marrow transplant and cell gene therapy. He's the current medical director of the Blood Transplant and Cell Therapies Laboratory and a CAR T cell clinician at Westmead Hospital. His research interests are in developing new cell and gene therapies. He's an investigator on multiple cell therapy trials for treatment of infections and blood cancers, including the first in human CAR T cell trials treating leukaemia and lymphoma. He is the recipient of multiple competitive grants from the Australian National and Medical Research Council and other funding bodies. He has been a member and chair of the Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration Advisory Committee on Biologicals for the last 10 years and has served as the Immunogene Therapy Committee Co-Chair for the International Society of Cell and Gene Therapy. He's a clinical Associate Professor at the University of Sydney, supervising and teaching multiple doctoral and medical students. So we're very lucky to have him here today. So over to you, Dr. Mickleway. Thanks, Tani. And uh, I just wanted to say a big thank you to Susanna and Tali. Um, you know, the, both of your stories are, are very powerful and, and um, you know, I, I wish all the best for both of you. Um, 
So I'll just share my screen now. Okay, can everyone see that? Is that a yes? All good. Excellent. Okay. All right. So, look, uh, um, I mean, good afternoon, everyone. I, I'd like, really like to thank the Leukemia Foundation for inviting me to talk to you all today about what I think is one of the most exciting advances in not just um, hematology, but in medicine um, in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and that is immune therapies for blood cancer. Now, um, I think it's fair to say that we're in the midst of a scientific revolution where people suffering from blood cancers resistant to standard chemotherapy are now being cured with immunotherapy. Now, broadly speaking, immunotherapy is any type of therapy that uses substances to stimulate or suppress the immune system to help the body fight cancer, infection, and other diseases. And this, as you can see here from this list, takes in a whole swath of, of, um, uh, of treatments. Um, but our time today is limited. And so I'm going to provide you with a very brief introduction to the normal immune system, and then rapidly focus on T-cell immunotherapy especially, uh, particularly the genetically engineered immunity in the form of chimeric antigen receptor T-cells, otherwise known as CAR T-cells. Now, I should emphasize that the immune system is a, a highly complex network of cells, organs, proteins, and tissues whose main job is to prevent infection. But in a nutshell, we are an organism at war with the myriad organisms all around us. Um, our body is a fortress and we're walled in by um, the lining of our lungs and our gut and our skin. Um, and we have a, an organized army of immune cells, otherwise known as white blood cells. Uh, there are general troops that form the first line of, of defense known as the innate immune system. And the cells in this group they use very broad pattern recognition to see gross differences between us and um, threatening pathogens and respond promptly to those pathogens. Um, anyone who is a patient or who is a family or, or close friend of a patient will almost certainly be fam familiar with one of the most important of these innate immune cells called neutrophils. Um, you will know that uh, they play an important role in particularly preventing bacterial and fungal infections with chemotherapy. And many of you may have been watching the neutrophil count like a hawk, knowing that it needs to be at a certain level before it's safe for you to go home from hospital after, after chemotherapy. But today we're more interested in the specialist white blood cells that make up what is known acquired immunity. Now, um, this includes particularly B cells um, that fight both bacterial and uh, viral infections and T cells whose main role is actually to fight viral infections, but also acts as a, a general coordinating the entire immune system and, and, and um, helping fight and dampen down any exuberant uh, immune responses that could uh, potentially damage the, the body. Now, one of the important parts of the acquired immunity is that um, the cells involved uh, acquire a, a memory of any new infections that they encounter, which enables them to more rapidly respond to uh, reinfection uh, if it's encountered again. And this uh, underlies the, uh, the basis of vaccination, but also is a hint at some of the potential benefits of treatments like CAR T cells, where in some cases you can actually have persistence of those CAR T cells over the long term and they can actually respond to any potential emergence of the tumour that, that they initially uh, treated. So in normal health, B cells primarily act by producing antibodies. Now these antibodies are proteins that coat bacteria or viruses and they block entry of, of those infections into tissues and cells and they also guide other parts of the immune system to destroy the threat. 
um, almost acting like a, a flag to, to alert the rest of the immune system that the threat is, is present. T cells, on the other hand, have specialized receptors that recognize very short parts of, of viruses shown to it by an infected cell. The T cells then actually respond to that infected cell by destroying the infected cell and thus prevent further spread of the virus. Now, in uh, treatment, antibodies to, to specific cancer-associated proteins have been developed by immunizing mice uh, with that particular protein, isolating the B cells and then immortalizing them in the laboratory and using them to produce infinite amounts of what's called a monoclonal antibody that targets the cancer protein. Uh, the oldest clinically used monoclonal antibody is actually rituximab, which has been uh, part of the standard therapy for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia since 1997. And, and antibodies like rituximab can be administered through a drip or an injection under the skin. And, uh, you know, in a similar way to uh, fighting a viral infection, they activate the immune system to destroy the cancer cells. When combined with chemotherapy, monoclonal antibodies like rituximab improve survival in lymphoma and leukemia patients compared to chemotherapy alone, as you can see here with this survival curve um, over a 10-year sort of a, a period in people with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Now, T-cells actually have an even longer history in the treatment of blood cancer immuno and, and in immunotherapy, though initially it was somewhat unknowingly. And that's because um, much of the field of T-cell immunotherapy arose out of blood stem cell transplant for blood cell uh, cancers such as leukemia. Now, blood stem cell transplant itself has, actually has its origins in experiments after the detonation of the atom bomb in World War II, where bone marrow failure was seen to be one of the major features of radiation sickness in survivors of the initial blast. So in this context, uh, experiments in 1949 showed that mice receiving lethal doses of radiation um, when their spleen was shielded were able to survive. Now, further work showed that a similar protection uh, was conferred by infusion of spleen or bone marrow cells uh, from similar uh, mice, and that this was due to stem cells in those infusions. And so this was then applied to humans with blood cancer from the 1950s onwards by infusing healthy donor bone marrow stem cells after administration of otherwise lethal radiation or chemotherapy. And this was an attempt to intensify the treatment of those blood cancers beyond what was previously deemed to be possible. Over the last 70 years, more than a million transplants have been performed curing blood cancers and a range of other disorders. Now, in the early days of blood transplant, it was thought that its main benefit was, in fact, this protection from the dose-intensified therapy. However, it became clear through the 1980s and the 1990s that in actual fact, the main benefit of transplant was the new immune system, particularly T cells, which could recognize and kill any residual blood cancer that was uh, around and that was resistant to the radiation or the chemotherapy. Unfortunately, this graft versus leukemia effect is imperfect with only two out of every 10 patients with advanced leukemia surviving more than five years. Now, although the benefit um, is, uh, is much greater in those where um, transplant is applied early in a person's disease, for those who relapse after transplant, uh, there are very few treatments which can provide any chance of cure or long-term survival. So at the same time that this realisation regarding the importance of T-cells in blood stem cell transplant was occurring, it became clear that T-cells had potential to cure a broad range of cancers, uh, most famously otherwise incurable metastatic melanoma, such as seen here in this patient before and after receiving tumour-specific lymphocytes in the form of what is known as tumour-infiltrating lymphocytes. So this work was actually started in the 1980s by a, a Professor Stephen Rosenberg at the National Institute of Health in the USA, who noted that melanoma biopsies often contained lymphocytes, which were T cells mixed in with the cancer cells. What he discovered was that these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes 
could be isolated and grown in the lab and could then recognize and kill those same cancer cells that they'd been mixed in with. It was seen that this was in a similar way to how normal T cells respond to, to part, small parts of viral protein shown to them by an infected cell. Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TILs actually recognize and respond to mutated tumor proteins through those exact same receptors. This leads to TIL activation and tumor destruction. Now in the setting of stem cell transplant, donor T cells um, will sometimes recognize mutated proteins in the leukemia cells, but they also have another way of recognizing um, leukemia cells in that they can recognize small differences in the proteins of the recipient compared to the donor. And this, um, this is one of the major reasons you get a graft versus leukemia effect and um, also unfortunately underlies what's called the graft versus uh, host disease. Unfortunately though, many tumors such as blood cancers lack cancer proteins or there aren't enough differences between the donor and recipient proteins that can be recognized by the lymphocytes and hence, the, the tumor cells are actually invisible to the immune system. So to overcome this, scientists over the last 30 to 40 years have been developing engineered immune cells that will respond to whatever target you choose. And there's now been approximately 15 years of experience using these engineered immune cells in the form of CAR T cells to cure blood cancer, such as this patient with advanced lymphoma, as you can see here on the left, who went into a complete remission on a clinical trial of CAR T cells targeting a, uh, a protein called CD19. So these engineered chimeric antigen receptor T cells or CAR T cells are cre created from general T cells that have been harvested from a patient's own uh, blood. Harvested T cells are reprogrammed with a new genetic code, which provides instructions to the T cell to make an artificial receptor, which is expressed on the T cell surface and which can um, enable the T cell to see the protein of interest on the surface of the tumor cell. When a CAR T cell encounters a tumor cell with a protein target, it becomes activated and destroys the tumor in the same way as an ordinary T cell will destroy a virus infected uh, cell. So CARs have now been designed for almost any tumor that you care to mention, but the most advanced CARs target a protein known as CD19, which is on the surface of B cell lymphoma and leukemia. And this has led to cure of individual patients with treatment refractory blood cancers like acute lymphoblastic leukemia, as seen here with the first uh, recipient of the CAR T cell product now known as Kim Raya, Emily Whitehead, who is more than 10 years uh, post-treatment and is free of leukemia and is now an advocate of, for funding and further development and research into novel therapies of blood cancers. And this fantastic response has been repeated in larger clinical trials with relapse and refractory ALL, uh, producing greater than 50% uh, two-year disease-free survival in children with, with um, ALL that's relapsed, especially after allogeneic stem cell transplant. And this is um, particularly uh, encouraging because the historical um, survival of these people was, was close to, was less than 20%. So this has led to CD19 specific CAR T cells receiving regulatory approval for routine treatment of B cell malignancies in the United States, Canada, Europe, Britain, and Australia. And there are currently six CAR T cell products approved by the FDA, all of them for blood cancers, such as leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma, with more products for a range of tumors uh, in clinical trials. It should be noted that there are only three standard of care commercial CAR T cell products currently available routinely in Australia, all for B cell leukemia and lymphoma, with none currently available for myeloma, despite there being clear efficacy in people who've relapsed after multiple lines of therapy. And this is emblematic of 
the, the barriers that exist to CAR T cells and the downsides of CAR T cells. Um, there are significant hurdles to be overcome before CAR T cells can achieve their full potential in not just blood cancers, but a whole range of medical diseases. So firstly, while CAR T cells are better than chemotherapy and relapsed lymphoma and can be a miracle cure for many with otherwise incurable leukemia or lymphoma, such as this individual who is one of the first patients to receive Kimriah for chronic lymphocytic leukemia and is well over 10 years um, uh, in remission. Um, CAR T cells are not a miracle cure for everybody with nearly 50% of people with diffuse large B cell lymphoma relapsing over the first 12 months uh, post therapy. The other downside of CAR T cells is that, is that they also commonly have quite dramatic and potentially fatal toxicities such as neurotoxicity, which is characterized by language difficulties, disorientation, headache, and drowsiness. And you can see here this a really very good example of, of the kinds of things that you can see in a person who's received CAR T cells, a CAR T cell called AxiCell, and how their writing went from normal on day four to uh, very much chicken scratching on day five. Now, fortunately, most of these um, toxicities can be effectively managed with a, a, a well um, characterized and standardized treatment. And you can see here the, the recovery in, in this individual's writing only 24 hours after receiving um, that appropriate therapy. But there are a range of other sort of toxicities that can um, cause, uh, cause, you know, quite a lot of um, stress in, in patients and their, their carers. Um, and it's important to understand that in actual fact, the toxicity is, is intimately linked to the actual um, way that CAR T cells actually work in that what happens is that CAR T cells will see tumour, they will become very activated by the tumour and kill the tumour, but at the same time, they actually produce a whole range of inflammatory hormones called cytokines, which if you imagine having a really bad flu infection, um, that the, the feelings that you get when you have a really bad infection are primarily due to cytokines. And the levels of cytokines in CAR T cell therapy are many times higher than a typical infection. And so this can then mediate things like fevers, low blood pressure, difficulty breathing, um, and then the neurotoxicity, particularly uh, as, as mentioned. Um, there are also some other less dramatic, but still potentially important uh, toxicities, particularly a, a decrease in the blood counts, which may require regular blood transfusions, um, regular growth hormones to keep the white cells at, a, at an acceptable level. And this can actually persist for quite some time after the, the CAR T cells have been um, administered, even several months after the CAR T cells. The other major problem with CAR T cells is that due to their individual nature, um, the manufacture is very complex. It involves collection of starting material from a patient in Australia, shipping of that all the way over to the US, where they then genetically modify the T cells and expand them in the laboratory. They then freeze them and do a, a raft of quality tests and then they ship them back to Australia where the individual then receives those CAR T cells. Um, so this process takes four to six weeks and requires a robust chain of identity and um, is, is sort of uh, one of the reasons that, um, you know, people can require additional therapy while waiting for the CAR T cells themselves and can potentially run into problems with either disease progression or toxicity from that treatment while waiting for the CAR T cell manufacture. So not only is the manufacture of CAR T cells complex, but the whole patient journey from referral through to treatment and follow-up involves coordinated interaction with multiple medical specialists and support staff as exemplified in this flow chart, which um, is actually from Peter Mac uh, ca um, Cancer Centre in Melbourne, but we have similar ones here at here at Westmead where I work that that uh, that um, involve the the very long and complex journey encountering multiple multiple people. 
So the complexity of this CAR T cell delivery combined with the unique and potentially fatal toxicities requires the establishment of specialized dedicated services such as the Westmead Immune Effector Cell Program, which includes multiple staff with experience and expertise in managing that patient journey. In addition, the supporting departments are essential. So for example, um, we have a dedicated neurologist who reviews all of our CAR T cell patients and especially those who develop any CAR T cell toxicity. Um, we regularly provide education to the intensive care unit, to the emergency department, to nursing staff and medical staff who are involved in the care of CAR T cell patients, because it is so important to be able to recognize and manage um, the toxicities uh, to ensure optimal chance of people um, being cured with CAR T cells. All of this comes with a significant cost. So, the manufacturer itself um, costs approximately half a million dollars. And um, this combined with the need for specialised um, teams to manage people with CAR T cells means that um, the delivery of CAR T cells in Australia at the moment is restricted to just a handful of specialised centres across Australia in the major um, uh, major cities. Now, while this is acceptable for the few hundred blood cancer patients receiving CAR T cells at the moment, a considerable revolution in delivery of engineered immune cells will be required to enable their widespread use for all the possible use the indications um, that, that, that uh, they may be beneficial for. So this obviously quite dramatically impacts the experience of the patient. Um, so a patient may have to travel a significant distance from their home and live close to the CAR T cell center for a, a month or more um, whilst receiving the CAR T cell therapy. There is usually, due to this complexity, an initial very lengthy conversation looking at whether CAR T cells are the right treatment for a particular individual. And also if they meet the stringent criteria that's been set by um, the TGA and the, the Medical Advisory Committee. Um, there's also multiple steps, as you could see from that flow sheet. This includes a donor workup with multiple consents, blood tests, formal tests of organ function, the T cell collection by apheresis. And then once that has occurred, the individual returns to the referring uh, treatment centre for management during manufacture. And this may this may vary quite considerably from person to person. So some people don't need any what we call bridging therapy at all, but others may require radiotherapy. Others may require intensive chemotherapy just to keep the, the tumour under control while waiting for the CAR T cells to be manufactured. And then obviously um, the uh, stay in hospital and management of the potential toxicities can be very frightening. And particularly if someone comes from out of one of those major cities, they are dislocated from most of their support network. Um, so generally people can only afford to have one support person or a couple of support people live with them um, close to the, the CAR T cell centre. Um, and so there's, there is a, a certainly a sense of isolation that, that people can, can experience. Now, very importantly, there are a lot of supports for travel and for accommodation. And so most people, um, you know, do not have to pay significant amounts of money um, to be able to access CAR T cells. And we regularly look at the proportion of people receiving CAR T cells from Sydney and from rural um, areas uh, at Westmead. And uh, I mean, I'm pleased to say that there seems to be a, a very proportionate um, uh, distribution of patients from, from the city and, and the bush, um, and that the speed of accessing the CAR T cells is very, very, very uh, much uh, the same. So um, that that is something that we very closely monitor um, and are acutely aware of potential disparities in, in access to CAR T cells. So what are some of the future developments that might actually enable CAR T cells to be 
um, delivered to more people. Um, so the first thing is that there is um, a lot of work on looking at changing this from a boutique individualized therapy to something that is much more like a standard chemotherapy or a standard drug. So um, researchers now for the last decade have been working on what we call off-the-shelf engineered immune cells. And the most basic form is using a healthy donor and using one of the newer gene editing platforms such as CRISPR-Cas9 to actually um, knock out potential damaging genes that, that could mediate toxicity of donor um, T cells. Uh, and to insert the actual chimeric receptor. These can then be banked in multiple um, aliquots and then can be just taken when the patient needs, uh, needs the CAR T cells and delivered uh, over a very short time frame, circumventing many of the complexities of CAR T cell delivery at the moment. In the future, there uh, is hope that we won't need to repeatedly collect T cells from healthy donors, but we will be able to create a resource of stem cells that could then actually be able to infinitely produce as many CAR T cells as we need um, for, for as long as we need them. Um, again, being able to bank these in aliquots and deliver them as needed to multiple recipients. One other potential way of actually overcoming many of the barriers to CAR T cell delivery is to manufacture them on site at the hospital in which a patient is being uh, treated. And this um, is actually a reality at the moment, and it's being um, being looked at in a, in a number of clinical trials um, using semi-automated or automated manufacturing platforms where essentially the scientists, the manufacturing scientists simply hang the immune cell, the collected immune cells on the machine. The machine then does all of the work in, in generating the CAR T cells. And over a very short period of time, ranging from a week to two weeks, those CAR T cells are then ready for uh, administration. Of course, one of the dreams of uh, hematologists and scientists is to avoid that cell manufacture altogether and to be able to actually deliver particles or um, viral vectors directly into a patient and have them so that they actually home into T cells, they reprogram the T cells within the patient's own body and then enable those T cells to actually recognize and kill off uh, leukemia or lymphoma. Um, at the moment, this is very much science fiction, but the tools to do this are already in existence. And um, there are, in fact, some clinical trials which are, are soon to be initiated in this very space. And so this is a very exciting um, you know, area. So look, I think I'll just conclude by um, just summarizing that immune therapies are revolutionizing the treatment of blood cancers. Um, CAR T cells in particular are leading the way in producing you know, quite dramatic cures in, in some people with previously incurable blood cancers. Um, however, there are quite a number of obstructions, particularly the complexity of delivery the, and the cost um, and the toxicities of the CAR T cells, which prevent them from achieving their full potential. Uh, but there is this, the field is evolving quite rapidly and there are new products and methods of delivery that promise to overcome these obstructions and accelerate the cell therapy revolution. With that, I'd like to, to thank everyone um, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Associate Professor McQuaith. For your comprehensive presentation, that was amazing. Really good insights into how the immune system actually works, which is really helpful. Um, I think there's some, you provide some really great insights into how those treatments actually work. But also I love the fact that you've touched on the practical issues surrounding access um, for people to these. Um, and it's, it's great to know there's so much up and coming trials into all different types of blood cancers. So thank you again. And thank you again to Susanna and Tali. Um, your presentations were just amazing, but I now invite Linda to present your questions that you've asked. 
Thank you, Tani, and thanks to Ken Tarley and Susanna again. Um, you know, Ken, I think you've um, certainly encapsulated, it was a big brief, um, a lot to share and um, making a very complex topic as less complex as possible. Um, um, very much appreciated. And Tali and Susanna for bringing that information to life through your own personal experiences. Um, Ken, can I um, ask you to stop sharing um, your screen and we'll jump into the questions. There are several that have come through um, the chat live and also many pre-submitted questions. Um, please know we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, many have already been covered in the presentation. So um, we're really going to be focusing on some, um, some uh, new information and, and the, and the um, questions that haven't been covered. Um, also recognising that everyone's circumstances are incredibly individual um, and this is really general information for you to feel empowered to go and have conversations with um, you know your treating teams and and your families um, and um, you know to give you the information that you need to make informed decisions. Um, I think one of the really critical questions that always comes up is um, is this treatment for me? Um, so how do, Ken, I'll, I'll direct it um, firstly to you and then invite Susanna and Tali if you want to um, provide some insights for how this related to you personally. But how do clinicians, so doctors in particular, um, decide who is a suitable candidate for this type of treatment? Um, and look, if we, I guess we've spoken really a lot about CAR-T, so perhaps we use that as the, as the example. So I think there's there's several layers to that. So the first is that just like any other therapy, we try to use evidence um, to uh, inform decisions about whether or not it's a, a good therapy for an individual. Because it's it's CAR T cells are not perfect; they're a part of an over overarching, you know, suite of tools that we have to uh, to to treat um, patients. And so we first of all look at the evidence, um, but there is also quite strict um, criteria for eligibility for CAR T cells. Um, so at the moment, there are three products that are uh, approved in Australia. Um, these are for uh, currently for relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma, where someone has received several lines of therapy in and relapsed or refractory to those several lines of therapy, including an autologous stem cell transplant, unless um, they are ineligible for the transplant or they have progressed whilst receiving the second line of chemotherapy and, and hence can't get uh, an autologous transplant. So, yep. so that's diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, there has also recently been um, mantle cell lymphoma uh, again, two lines of therapy, one of which has to in, include a particular drug called a, a BTK in, inhibitor. Um, and then there is approval for um, uh, children and young adults with relapsed acute lymphoblastic le leukemia yeah. up to the age of 25. The TGA has approved um, another product for um, adults with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, um, but that is currently going through the process, process of negotiations regarding the price and who is going to pay for it and how that's going to be paid for. So it's not actually widely available for that at, the, at this particular time, but hopefully within the next you know, couple of months, it will also be available for acute lymphoblastic leukemia in adults. And again, it's sort of multiple relapses, particularly after an allogeneic stem cell transplant. And I, I should note that um, particularly with acute lymphoblastic leukemia um, and in children, an allogeneic stem cell transplant is still the um, most effective way of achieving a cure. And so that's one of the reasons it's only used after an allogeneic stem cell transplant if they can have a, a, a transplant. Um, we've had some people in the past who have really wanted CAR T cells rather than the transplant, um, but they weren't eligible. And in fact, 
the transplant was the best treatment for them. Mm -hmm. So that's that's sort of important to, to sort of understand that CAR T cells aren't necessarily, just because they're new, it doesn't mean that they're actually better than all of the other treatments that we have. Is there, in addition to the particular diagnoses and the particular treatments that people have had, because we know that once people are looking at making decisions around CAR T or immunotherapy that they've had multiple lines of treatment. Are there other health considerations that you look at, um, for example, in terms of the person's own um, health status, um, age? Um, I think a lot of people, are, particularly with uh, blood cancer being uh, predominantly an older person's um, diagnosis, what, you know, what could you comment a little bit about how you look at age and yeah. comorbidities in the context of decision making? So, so age is not a contraindication. Okay. Um, the it's mostly about organ function and a, a person's level of of actual function. We know that if someone is bed bound, that the CAR T cells will probably kill them. So we don't give give CAR T cells to people who are, who are not able to get out of bed. Um, we know that if people have poor heart function, that there's a a, a strong chance of very severe that they won't cope with, with toxicity. Um, and so we have cutoffs for heart function and for kidney function and liver function, but we do not have a cutoff for age. Yep. Now, it should be noted, however, that as you get older, there is an increased chance of getting the neurotoxicity um, and more severe neurotoxicity compared to a younger individual. But that's the main difference, actually, um, between sort of older and, and younger people. The other sort of issue, obviously, is, is with age. Sometimes our general fitness will drop off. And so if you do become sick and, and need intensive care for any reason, whether that's the CAR T cells or, or infection or, or other sort of complications, that your road to recovery is often longer than a, a young, a fit individual. So those things need to be you know considered. But age itself is definitely not a... a um, a contraindication. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's really taking that holistic view of the person. Um, Susanna and Tali, um, are you able to share with, with us a little bit about, I guess, that that decision-making process that Ken's talked about, what they look at from a clinical perspective? You know, from a personal point of view, what was that like for you both? And what were some of the really major considerations that were important for you in making in making these this decision, I invite either of you to uh, jump in. Um, so I guess I felt like I didn't really have a choice um, because my prior two lines of treatment um, weren't working, and my tumor was growing, and it was spreading. Um, so when I was told that you know I was no longer a able to have a stem cell transplant and my next one was CAR T um even though I didn't really know much about it but I knew you know the potential side effects um especially with the neurotoxicity like it 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 did scare me a lot but I kind of felt like well I don't I don't really have a choice I mean yes everyone has a choice but it wasn't a choice for me um I felt like it was yeah it if it worked fabulous and if it didn't well you know then I would de deal with it then but um yeah I felt like it was going to be my only hope um so but to get to that point I did have to go through a lot of um tests to be eligible to have it um so I had to have a lung function test a fitness test you know all these heart tests um, but I also had to have bridging radiation for nearly three weeks because it was so aggressive and growing quickly. Um, but by the time, you know, my cells were collected, they came back and did all of that. You're just like, okay, well, I don't have a choice. So let's just go into it. And you hope for little as possible side effects. Thanks, Tali. Susanna, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure, if I could. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess um, mine was a little different. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. 
uh, mine was a little different in the fact I know I did touch on that originally, um, that I, of course, have had le acute lymphoblastic leukaemia, which, as Ken said, is difficult. They're still not really giving it to a lot of people that are adults, CAR T for it. Of course, that's the one that I had, the one that the children normally have. So that was my dilemma, trying to get to get accepted to do CAR T. And in fact, originally I was told I could do it in Brisbane. And then that was reneged probably three or four hours later after I was celebrating, thinking I'm going to get this. So I didn't have a big enough leukemia burden, apparently. So I needed to have more leukemia. And once again, my age was over 25. So that was difficult, yeah. But um, doing it, like Tali, it was offered as, <laughs> as a decision that I had to make. And as, as I said to my hematologist, I said, well, what choice do I have? I said, either I have the treatment, I have 40% chance it'll work, or I, don't have, or I don't have the treatment and I'll die because there's nothing else. This will be the end of the road. I need to try something. I was having a bridging treatment in between after I'd relapsed before CAR-T just to try and keep it at bay. And that lasted for quite a few months as well. I did quite a few courses of that and had a lot of side effects with that. But quite honestly, after the transplant, CAR-T was so much easier, so much easier. Only two weeks in hospital as opposed to four. And I didn't get any neurotoxicity. I was very fortunate with that. I know that a lot of people do, but for me, it, it was so much easier than, than, doing, than doing a transplant. And I'm so glad I did it. <laughs> was well worth, well worth it. Thanks, Susanna. It certainly sounds like that is a common experience. It's, you know, it's where, as I think we've talked about, at that pointy end of decision-making where a lot of other treatments haven't worked. And so it's, they're really big, big decisions to be making. Mm. Um, just, you know, talking, uh, Ken, you touched on the toxicities and, and Susanna and, and Tali have then around uh, CAR-T specifically. Um, what do we know about, obviously, this being a new and emerging field, um, what do we know about late and long-term effects of CAR-T? Do we have any um, good information now to sort of give us some indication of what people are experiencing many years down the track from treat from this type of treatment yeah so look i mean the the we now have you know 10 plus years of data from the early clinical trials using a variety of different car t cells um, most of the individuals who have remained in remission during that time are living healthy, normal lives. There are some potential long-term uh, side effects or complications. So the, um, the CAR T cells target not just the cancer B cells, but they target healthy B cells as well. And so there is the, you can have a long-term B cell deficiency. And that means you can have low antibody levels in your blood. Uh, and in some cases, you will you have an increased risk of infections mm -hmm. over the long term. And you can have um, a, a uh, need, need to have regular healthy donor antibody infusions, so immunoglobulin infusions. So that's one of, I guess, the, the commonest. Um, the... Low blood counts that can occur after CAR T cells usually resolve by about three months after the CAR T cells. And in many people, they'll, they'll be um, free of need for any transfusions after the first month. Um, but there are occasional people who will have persistent low blood counts for many months, even a year or longer after the, after the CAR T cells. And in the worst case, um, these people may actually need a stem cell transplant from a healthy donor to prevent um, the various complications from having very low blood counts um, mm -hmm. for, for the long term. Um, so there's, there's, um, there's a variety of, of um, those sorts of long-term side effects. I think um, 
there's been some work looking at the risks of second cancers after CAR T cells. Yeah. And in general, um, the risk of second cancers after transplant mostly reflects the amount of chemotherapy that people have had before they get, sorry, before they get the CAR T cells. So after CAR T cells reflects that, that um, amount of, of chemotherapy that they've had before the CAR T cells rather than the CAR T cells causing an increased risk of, of okay. second cancers themselves. So that's sort of probably the, the most important thing. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons that um, there are, um, there are sort of trials that have been implemented trying to look at earlier use of CAR T cells um, to try and reduce the amount of chemotherapy that people are uh, exposed to over their, um, their their treatment journey. Great. Thank you. Talia or Susanna, would you like to add anything there before we move on to the next question? You can just yay or nay. Hey, Great. Um, Ken, you talked, um, you covered in your presentation very uh, broadly um, about the, the sort of three big blood cancers, your leukaemia, lymphoma and myelomas. Um, what's happening in the blood disorder space? So um, do you know of, um, you know, or where are we at in the um, uh, treatment of, you know, the, those MDSs, MPNs? in clinical trials. I think one person had commented in our pre-submitted questions that she was having some type of immunotherapy for aplastic anemia. So, you know, what we're seeing is sort of this concept being, you know, got really spreading far and wide um, into different disease streams. Uh, do you, are you able to comment much on what's happening in some of those other um, uh, blood cancer or blood disorder um areas yeah so i mean immunotherapy is is something that um that sort of plays a role in a variety of of uh blood sort of cancers or blood disorders um i mean even in multiple myeloma there's a class of drugs called immunomodulatory drugs um so thalidomide and lenalidomide one of the ways that they work is to somehow modulate the immune response to the myeloma cells um, so there is a form of immunotherapy in nearly everything. And then obviously the big one is allogeneic stem cell transplant, um, which is used for a whole range of, of uh, blood cancers from myelofibrosis um, to acute myeloid leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, and, and we know that the main benefit from stem cell transplant is actually the immunity transplant that you get from the donor. And that, and that is really kind of the, you know, one of the oldest and, and still the most effective for acute myeloid leukemia uh, immune therapies that, that exists. Um, but I think people are probably more interested in, are there, you know, CAR T cells down the line for any of these things? Um, so myelodysplastic syndrome, myelofibrosis, I'm, you know, I don't think that there's any good, um, any any good sort of um, CAR T cell treatments on the horizon for those, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Acute myeloid leukemia, um, there is work. The problem with acute myeloid leukemia is that the potential targets for CAR T cells are also widely expressed on your normal healthy stem cells. And so um, CAR T cells may be able to cure the leukemia, but they will also knock out the healthy stem cells. And so there are some really clever uh, things that are being done by researchers where they're actually combining CAR T cells with a stem cell transplant, and they're actually engineering the stem cells uh, from the healthy donor to, um, to not have the target of the, of the CAR. And so you co-infuse CAR T cells and stem cells, and that then will eliminate the the leukemia and the healthy stem cells will will then sort of you know replenish the, the the normal blood so so there's some quite interesting things happening there um but there is still a lot of work to be done there's still a lot of developments um in a whole range of those those diseases that that's being being explored so um there's there's quite a lot of a lot of room to grow here yeah yeah great thank you um, 
of uh, talking about you touched on the um sort of access um um of these treatments um and we work a lot with people who are living in the rural regional remote areas um who often we know often have uh, uh poorer outcomes because of their access um in terms of how can they be advocating for themselves with their treating teams, you know, to um, be connecting with these, you know, specialist centres, you know, what can people be doing to ensure that 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 they are um, engaging with those specialist services at the right time and not missing out on these on these critical treatments? Yeah, that's that's quite a difficult one. I mean, we have tried. Um, to sort of provide education to referring specialists um, to ensure that people who would benefit from CAR T cells get referred. And we, in general, we've, we've tried to encourage, even if the patient doesn't quite meet the criteria, we, we, we've encouraged the referring specialists to try and, and refer them early, um, especially if there are issues like distance and whatnot, then, then being aware of them and, and being able to talk to the referring specialist to, and discuss them helps us keep an eye on them. You know, so we've had a few people that have been referred and they haven't quite met the criteria, but we've mo monitored them over, you know, several months and then they've become eligible and we've been able yep. to very rapidly, um, you know, get them to CAR T cells. So I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that we're trying to do. Um, I think from a patient point of view, it's really just a matter of raising it with, with your treating specialist. You can say, look, are CAR T cells right for me? And you know, I I think that's that's something that you you need to you need to discuss with your treating specialist because they will know you best and they'll know your particular um, situation. Um, but then, obviously, coming to meetings like this and learning a little bit more about about what they are and what they can possibly do, um, and going and reading those resources that you're posting on the the chat, um, which will give people a bit more information about, you know, when CAR T cells are, are used and whatnot will help patients actually advocate for themselves because yeah. not all, not all referring specialists do necessarily, like we, we try our best, but we can't necessarily get to every single referring specialist. And then I'm sure there are some who we've not, you know, been able to communicate directly with who, if the patient comes to them, they'll say, what about CAR T cells? And the referring specialist can then, pick up the phone and give us a call. Great. Yeah, it is really just about even, I think that's a really great message about even if they may not be eligible right in this moment, it's not to say that that may not change in the future and that's important to explore all possible options um, and to work through each of those. So um, I think, yeah, really thank you for um, for highlighting that. Um in terms of practicalities, you know, um, Susanna and Tali, for you two, as you embarked on um, CAR-T treatment, what were some of the practicalities that you had to take into consideration, you know, be that around your work or your families or um, how you, you know, live day to day? What were some of the sort of key things that you needed to um, make adjustments to, I guess? Um, so when I went in to have um, CAR T, we were still kind of, uh, we were sort of in and out of lockdowns. Um, so my hematologist said, you know, we don't know how long you're going to be in there for. Kind of bank on maybe two weeks. So my husband had to stop work to be with the kids to homeschool them. Um, we didn't know if they were actually going to be able to even come in. So the morning that I went to have my cells, um, we basically had to say goodbye because I didn't know if they were allowed to come in. Um, so there was a lot of kind of planning to do with that and also get them comfortable with the fact that, you know, I'd be gone for, well, we didn't know, it could have been up to a month. Um, I obviously couldn't work anymore when I was there. Um, yeah, my husband had to take time off. There was a lot of stuff to 
kind of organized before you even went in and then you didn't even know what was going to happen um yeah wasn't easy I think you said you described it in your um talk as a um a stone in a pond and that yeah. ripple effect I think that's a yeah. really good visual image of 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 that of that effect for all of yeah. those around and I you. always said you know even though I was the one going through all the treatment I feel like it was still worse for them um to to have to watch or you know even though I was disappointed um you know when all my treatments weren't working you know they were even more disappointed um so often I I've I've always said that I think it is worse for the family members um mm. Then, then you're the one going through it, but it's worse for them. Yeah, is it? A, it's that sense of helplessness and watching, yeah. watching from 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 the sidelines. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Susanna, I, you I, to... I agree with that as well. I actually, that it was very, very difficult for my family. Incredibly difficult. And as I said, my daughter deferred uni for a while to look after me. So that was with, that was before I even had a transplant. That was just when I was having chemotherapy because I was an inpatient for such a long time and I had several infections. So I actually didn't go home as I should have. I was in there for months. <laughs> it was such a long time. And from a person that had never been in hospital before, I'd always been so healthy. So it was quite a shock, a shock to my family. I'd always been on the go. But, yes, it was difficult with work as well, and I still kept my business running, and it's now almost three and a half years later, and now I'm closing the doors. I did a lot of quotes from my hospital bed. Mm -hmm. My daughter would bring paperwork in and discuss it with me when I was up to it, if I was awake or if I could speak. <laughs> yeah, wow. But yeah, very difficult for the family, and, and I have spoken to them about it since seeing how, how on earth did you cope? And they said they were absolutely terrified. They, they were so worried about me. And because you're in such a daze and you're in pain and you have to sleep and you don't sleep, I think it is worse for them because they're looking at you. Yeah. Yeah. Horrific for them. But, um... Yeah, it's certainly yeah. important we're taking care of families as well, isn't it, in all of this. We need to be caring for okay. both the person themselves diagnosed and and the family members as well that is just mm. as important um, lots of things to take into consideration and Ken I think I remember you saying to me um, that you spend an hour and a half speaking to the patient and the family on that initial com consultation so I think that's you know credence to just how complex and how important a decision this is and how many elements need to really be talk through in order to um, proceed with this treatment. Um, can I ask, you know, talking about some of the practical and logistical elements, um, I think, um, Tali, you may have touched on this a little around the costs incurred um, or were there any costs incurred because often people, um, you know, particularly um, in our day, in, in in this current climate where we're in a, you know, a cost of living crisis and with blood cancer, often people can't work. So there's a reduction in income and increase in costs. Um, is there, were there any added costs associated with you engaging in um, this type of treatment? Um, if so, what that, what was that? Um, all um, um and and what did you rely on uh, uh, to support you over that time of treatment? Um, so, like Susanna said before, you know, um, they were prepared to pay up to a million dollars to have the treatment. Um, you know, and so were we. Um, we were thinking, you know, we'll sell our house if we have to go to the US, we'll do it. Um, but luckily um my hematologist was fighting at the time to get my um car t uh, listed on the pbs um which took longer than expected um but luckily it was funded um so fortunately i didn't have any um costs with it um but yeah we were prepared to 
do whatever we could to get it. It's a, it's a potential huge financial um, impact, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and then at the time, I obviously I couldn't work because yes. I was in hospital. Um, yeah, so we were just relying on my husband's income. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, luckily there were no costs with the actual treatment. In itself, yeah. Um, Susanna, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say we are very fortunate here in Australia because the costs were completely covered by Medicare and I don't know how expensive the treatment is and the transplant. I know it was millions of dollars. <laughs> But it really, we are very, very fortunate. So it was really only medications mm. taking home with us that we had to pay for. Um, and that was all really, did you find the same? Yeah. Talia? Talia? Yeah. Same yeah. with you? Yeah. 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 And in, in the scheme of things, that's very little, isn't it? Mm. It's just difficult if you can no longer work and be doing well, that, that makes it hard. Yeah, that's where the financial strain often um, is when you when you're unable to to earn an income, and then um, I think we yeah certainly touched on those people living regionally and rurally who need to um, relocate to to um, mm -hmm. in order to um, uh, access those treatments. Um, we hear a lot about um, you know CAR T in the media. Um, or immunotherapy more broadly, and and then and CAR T, um, and and often particularly people when they've um, um, had multiple lines of treatment and are, and are looking at other options, um, and wonder if this is for them, and um, they have hope um, of that this will be the you know the the um, miracle cure, um, miracle treatment. How do you help people, um, and can I directing this to you around, how do you help people moderate their expectations around this type of treatment? Um, you know, just, you know, with what we hear and then what the reality of, of the treatment is. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, I think it's natural, particularly with a new, and I mean, this is just, this is science fiction, right? We're reprogramming mm. our immune system genetically engineering our immune system to fight cancer for us. I mean, it's, 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 when it you think imagined. about it, it's, yeah, it's, well, it's my, it's mind blowing really what, what we're doing here. Um, and so I think it's natural to get really excited. And the other thing is there's a tendency within the popular media to focus on the positive stories in this, in the space of health, because, well, it's fantastic, you know, when people are cured of, of their disease, which, was otherwise incurable, you know, like that's, that's amazing stuff. Yeah. And so it is, it can sometimes be difficult to, to retain perspective. Unfortunately, no therapy, even CAR T cells are, um, are miracle cures for everyone. Um, and so, you know, the simplest way is just to talk to people about what they know about CAR T cells, what they've heard, what they expect and just to be upfront and honest with them, you know, that's that's generally my approach is is particularly to find out. I, I find that that finding out what they actually understand, what they expect, is the most important thing because then I I have a starting point in which we can discuss. Well, you know, is that you know the the most likely outcome or whatnot? I think though, you know, you mentioned that I I told you that we spend an hour and a half or, or more with, with patients in that first thing. And it's, I mean, it's very overwhelming. The whole thing is overwhelming and there's so much, it's so new and there's so much information. Um, and the bottom line is that even if people take in everything that I say, it's not until they're actually going through the experience that it's, it becomes real to them. Um, and, and so I'm always mindful of that as well when I'm talking to them, that I can modulate or, or, or sort of tone down their expectations. But the bottom line is, uh, you know, each person is an individual and experiences things in a different way. And so it's really as they go through the, the journey that we try to, you know, we try to provide them more continuous information and, and sort of updates as, as they go through it. Yeah. 
Yeah, good point. I think it is. It's sometimes for many people like an out of body experience where you're just trying to take on all that information. Um, and when you're so overwhelmed and and feeling so um, uh, anxious and fearful, um, is is really difficult. Um, and often, you know, people say to us. Uh, it's not till even after treatment that we start to actually process what has actually happened to us. Um, it's it's a bit of a survival, and then we and then we do, and then we uh, digest it and work through it. So um, yeah, really good point. Um, really interesting question, um, a pre-submitted question. You know, there's a, you know um, everyone knows about chemotherapy. So when you're diagnosed with cancer and you say you're having chemotherapy. Most people have some sort of sense of what it is and how to explain it. Um, but how do, and I, I'm going to direct this to Susanna and Tali, how did you go about explaining to um, friends, family uh, that you were having immunotherapy? You know, it's easy for people to understand chemo, um, but what's a simple way to, or did you find a way to explain what immunotherapy was in a really uh, easy to understand way? Um, I, I think I did. And it sounds very similar to what Tali had actually originally said, where I just explained it as going to have another port put in my chest and then I was going to be sitting in the chair for you know, hours upon hours and then my cells were going to be, and I saw it being boxed up in an ice box and a courier came to pick it up as I finished my treatment and whisked away to the States for three weeks to be um, you know, altered so that they were cancer-fighting cells. Come back, quick infusion, I mean, literally just six or seven minutes. Mm -hmm. It was such a small, small bag to be infused and then they start doing their work just targeting the cancer cells and killing them. That was yep. was the easiest way that I could think to explain it and that's the way that I saw it. Is that how you thought it was as well, Tali? Yeah. Um, yeah, very similar to you. That's what I would tell them. And then so they'd often ask, so what's the difference? And I'd say, well, immunotherapy, you know, uses your own immune system to try and fight the cancer. Um, so most of the time, you know, it won't attack the good will only attack the bad. Um, but then we were also, luckily enough, we found a video um, on the Peter Mac website about CAR T cell therapy. So, and it was only, you know, maybe a two minute video. So sometimes if they really didn't get it, um, we'd send them the link to the video and then they'd say, yeah. oh, I get it. Um, but yeah, they were all like, oh, that's so cool. You're going to be like AI and like <laughs> but okay <laughs> yeah yeah great um yeah great strategies and yeah those um you know lean on those resources that are available um like yeah that video through Peter Mac to help it you know make make what is a really really complex um uh topic you know as simple as possible um you know for yourself and for others so um one last question, and then it's we we are at time. Um, you know, obviously we know that. Um, you know, can you showed us a picture of the future? You know, where you know the possibilities of where CAR T is going, um, and um, how we can how it can be more efficiently pro you know, produced here locally, and then obviously looking at the you know developing it in the person themselves with the person themselves. Um, we know that's going to take a, a, as you said, I think a revolution in order to 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 get to to that place. What can we be doing? And you know, Susanna and Tali, um, um, please, um, you know, comment. What can we be doing to advocate for better access and funding? Um, not just as individuals, but as a blood cancer community. Um, just a, a nice, nice one to end on. Um, I feel like I know there's a lot of processes that it goes through before it kind of gets to the government approval. Um, I feel like maybe those processes need to be looked at um, 
And I also feel like I think if organisations used, I guess, people's personal stories like we are doing today, um, maybe then the government and the other bodies will realise that, you know, it shouldn't only be about the cost of the treatment. It's it's people's lives and their families' lives that they're actually deciding on. Um, yes, I know the money is important, but at the end of the day, so many people are dying either waiting for the treatment to be approved or because it simply isn't approved. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's kind of, it's not good enough that it comes down to the cost of the treatment. Mm. Susanna. Yeah, I guess, that, unfortunately, that's what it, it is at the moment, isn't it? Ken said mine's not even approved yet, the treatment that I had for my for my type of leukaemia. So it, it is still very difficult for people to access it. I mean, I guess it's getting a little easier, but I think a year ago I was number one in New South Wales and number seven in Australia for the type of leukaemia I have. And it would be good to think that people could access this. I don't know how you go about it. I really don't, but... Yeah, for sure. It's it's such a tricky one. And as, as Tali said, I, I, I know personally of some people that I've connected with that haven't been able to have the treatment and passed away before the treatment. And it's mm. it is very sad. Yeah. Yeah, it has a a huge impact. Ken, did you wanna um round out that? If any comments? Well, so, I mean, this is, this is actually a very difficult question um, because, you know, there's so many steps involved in actually developing a new therapy and then proving that it actually works and then getting it so that it actually can be available for as many people as might benefit. Um, the, you know, the... Um, I think one important thing is involvement in clinical trials. So these are only available now because people over the last decade have willingly gone into clinical yeah. trials before we knew that these were as effective as what they are. And there are clinical trials of a whole range of therapies that are, you know, constantly you know, occurring. Right. And so I think one one thing I would just encourage anyone who is in a situation where they are undergoing treatment um, for any, almost any disorder is always consider whether or not a, there's a clinical trial available for your disorder and whether or not it's something that you want to go in, because when you do that, you're contributing to yeah. future generations. And so that would be something, I guess, you know, I think it would be it would be important because, as I said, we are here today because people have taken that step in the past and have have thought about the future and thought about people in the future and, and wanted to make a difference to, to people down the track. So that would be, I think, the major thing I'd talk about. Um, and, yeah, so and and so that would include some of these newer ways of delivering CAR T cells yeah. that might, you know, will, will dramatically reduce the cost and increase the availability um, such as the local manufacturer or off the shelf, those sorts of things, I think it would be important for people to consider. Um, and and lots of those are actually going on at the various CAR T cell centres at the moment. So, um, so yeah, so so I think that those were the, the kinds of things I'd encourage everyone to think about, clinical trials especially, and, and how they can contribute to the future development of, of these revolutionary therapies. Great. I think that's a really um, lovely message to, to finish on. Um, I think... Uh, earlier we we obviously call the clinicians who are leading these trials as trailblazers but I think the participants the people who are willing to participate in clinical trials are the real tra trailblazers um, so thank you to Tali and Susanna and to all the people who are who have previously been on clinical trials and currently on clinical trials because this is what shapes our future um, for blood cancer treatment. So thank you so much, Ken, Susanna and Tali for an incredibly um, informative um, 
a conversation about uh, about this area. There is, it is, I think, as we've discovered, it is so complex. Thank you for simplifying it um, in a way that makes it more digestible um, and for people to really contemplate um, it um, um, in their own lives. Um, and Susanna and Tali, you know, for giving us a, a very small snapshot of of um, of what that experience was like for you both. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Tani to close out today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. There's been such an incredible amount of information shared. And I think uh, looking at the chat, I think everything, everyone's learnt something today. So thank you so much. Um, so again, thank you to each of our excellent speakers for your generosity and sharing your knowledge, expertise and time with us, especially your time. Um, and most importantly, also thank you to all of those people with blood cancer out there that have joined us today. We encourage you to use the information to start conversations with your treatment team family and friends and to help guide your health recovery and your, and most importantly your quality of life so if you have any questions or concerns we encourage you to check out the resources on the website and the ones we've popped in the chat um, well you could also call 1800 620 420 to speak to someone in person um, there's a short feedback email that we would love you to complete um, just to hear your thoughts and to bring you more information that you'd like to know about um, a recording of this webinar will be available on the Leukemia Foundation website um, so that you can share with others and watch it again. Um, so that draws our webinar to a close. Thank you very much and goodbye for now.